What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and this is Block Digest number 205 at block height 611,299 on Saturday, January 4th. We missed Bitcoin's birthday by one day, guys. So what's going on, Nopar? Can you? Hey, guys. I would just like to say I'm pro-Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, my God. That shit is so stupid. Okay. <laughs> so, I'd like to, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rub this in everyone's faces. So the reason we recorded late, and you're gonna hear this an extra day late, is that's right. Shinobi can go buy marijuana at the marijuana store. Yeah. You mean Shinobi can go buy marijuana at the marijuana store legally? Yep. <laughs> And he can also do things like currently be exhaling perfectly legal substances from his lungs. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, I'm going to probably be Captain Space Cadet for the next couple weeks while I, uh, I revel in this new option. Ah, so, uh, I guess so we're in the, the we're in we're in the mystical 2020s now. New decade, new crazy shit to kick off. I can I can watch it all kick off high. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be talking about that a lot. I need I need to get some self control. Okay, moving on to the Bitcoin news show, not the marijuana news show. Uh I'm up, right? So uh, a couple weeks ago we talked about uh Project Blue Sky that Jack Dorsey set up um, with the intent of kind of having an analog of Square Crypto, a kind of independent, not profit motivated team um, with the explicit goal of turning Twitter into an open protocol instead of just a a service that uh, the company Twitter runs. Well, I think there's a really interesting post and an interesting plan on how to kind of start moving in that direction uh, by Raymond Chang and uh, Jeffrey Dash Su, I think is how you pronounce that. Um, and it's a really interesting strategy, I think. Um, so obviously the, the end goal of Blue Sky is to completely turn Twitter into an open protocol where the, the company's client for that is just one of a, a number of different clients you can choose. While um, Raymond and Jeffrey are proposing, but let's stop here, um, let's slow our roll and kind of find an intermediate step that we can do right now, rather than have this team run off and come up with all kinds of pie in the sky ideas and new ways to run things that Twitter just doesn't go with because it's too expensive, too complicated, eats into their revenue too much. And so um, he's suggesting starting um, very simply with the, this new concept of a lens. And the idea is that Twitter is still a centralized service. Like they're still running the, the central Twitter servers where everybody submits their tweets and gets their tweets from but they open up a software development kit and let third parties generate their own recommendation algorithms. So effectively, like you're, you're still, you know, stuck with Twitter as far as depending on them to, to post and read things. You're still stuck with Twitter for the, the namespace and having your identity. But just that, that one aspect of how they 
they use an algorithm to suggest content for you or filter content from you that open just that up uh, competitively to third parties. And kind of the, the reason here for this is looking at, um, you know, the, the kind of alternatives for social media, the, the federated alternatives like uh, Mastodon and the Fediverse and the, the full blown um, peer to peer protocols. Um, all of these things have issues at scale, big problems that, that need to be sorted out um, that are kind of fundamental to those types of architectures that just, you know, they, they screw up the user experience. And if you screw up the user experience, you drive users away, which drives revenue down. And so it's like, well, let's just start here. Let's start this one place filters for the content that Twitter hosts and serves and just open that up. And you can see how the market actually feels about that. Like, do users want to do that? Do they actually use different filters? Um, are other third parties actually going to spend the time and resources to develop other filters for this type of platform? Or are we just chasing a dead end? And the, the whole idea is you can, you can just start with this one place without fully decentralizing Twitter, like letting it stay a centralized service and just see how the market reacts to these kinds of changes. And if it happens in a positive way, then you can slowly start stepping forward and decentralizing more and more because the, this basic concept of a plug and play filter is completely out of scope of where is the data being served from or coming from. And so they, they even propose, you know, the, the different trade-offs between trusted hardware such as um you know trusted platform modules or the, the intel sgx versus zero knowledge proofs and how do you prove um during this initial kind of step in this direction that this tweet that twitter served to you was you know found and decided to be served to you based on the algorithm you want them using so that they can't just lie and keep feeding you tweets and not really use the filter you want them to use. And you know, it's kind of, you know, it, you can kind of just start here and keep going. If it keeps working, if people keep liking it, you just keep going further and further until you eventually get to, you know, the, the end of this proposal, if things are fully decentralized, is pretty much just have a, a DAO um, allocating funds to different people running servers um, that host and serve Twitter content, um, that, that track and organizing it, um, developers to maintain things. And so like, th this is really, I think, uh, a big shakeup. You know, when Blue Sky was first announced, I was kind of skeptical. Like, I like the idea, but like, is this gonna accomplish anything? And you know, within a couple of weeks now, it's from people not even part of that team um, here's, I think, a very promising idea on how to approach this and not kind of just run off the cliff and go too far with it. So, you know, what do you guys think about this? I think this is very interesting. Um, it's a very interesting experiment. I, I cannot, I don't have any other similar experiment in my mind that uh, a large already established company was would be really trying to take such a risk what what twitter is well we don't know if they are going to take it but they are open for at least researching how to to take take this thing to the next level and yeah I, Oh, maybe Microsoft when it started open sourcing everything and inviting more and more developers that 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 could be similar change in in Twitter. But yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I I'm actually not not I don't fully understand this new proposal. So what your correct me if I'm wrong. Um, my my impression was that. Is it still Twitter that's hosting the content? Yeah, that's like the, the whole point of, of this proposal is instead of like try to decentralize everything at the beginning, like let's just like Twitter still hosts things. It's still all centralized Twitter. 
but you you make different like al- algorithm um, filters that users can pick and choose from. So like think about it like a Twitter it's still Twitter but there's like a little app store now where instead of using Twitter's algorithm to to figure out what tweets to show you like you could go use the EF apps or if you're a big sports fan like you could go use ESPN and just have like a choice of what algorithms like Twitter is using to build your personal timeline. So Twitter is the ultimate filter here, right? Because I can't imagine if if you post something that's uh, socially unacceptable, borderline criminal thoughts that Twitter is going to just leave it there, right? Well, so, I mean, obviously, like you need, um, like Twitter has to act if it's outright illegal. But aside from that, I think the idea here is that Twitter acts less and less and just you put users in control of what they want to filter or not and just give them a big choice of like what filters to use. Yeah, uh, that, that's interesting. I mean, you could, you could, you could remove like from the five requirements that they have in their terms and conditions, like four because Four is not criminal. Four is they is just just their own filter, and maybe leave leave the 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 most uh, radical content uh, f- f- deleted right away. Right? Interesting. I, I I like it. And it's you know the the idea is like if if people like that, if they actually use that, then we can take more steps. And like actually try to decentralize stuff instead of just like give users these choices. So it's like instead of like start from the very beginning, like decentralize everything, like let's let's just add this this new filter concept and give users choices and let's see how they react to that first. And if they react positively, then let's move further. But you know, I mean kind of slowly step in that direction um, with Twitter right now rather than just leave Twitter alone and come up with a whole new thing and then try to get everybody to use this whole new thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I like the idea of having the option to choose your own filter. It'll be interesting though to see how it it really conflicts with how Twitter currently operates, which is they don't even let you, they don't even really give you the option to choose how to like, you follow a certain number of people and you think that would be really simple. You just get tweets and messages from those people. But instead, Twitter has a number of times like forced you to see stuff those people have liked or stuff people that the people you follow have liked or stuff that the people you follow follow have liked. I get random I get random messages in my timeline all the time from people I'm like I don't know who you are I've never seen you why is your stuff showing up in my timeline so Twitter so far has not taken a very you know let the user choose stance when it comes to filters and it's getting really annoying so I would be interested to see whether they you know how much how much progress in that area is actually made by Twitter, considering that their current uh, instantiation is really deficient in that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, and it's, you know, I want to say again, like this proposal is is from completely outside of Twitter. Like the, these guys, um, to my understanding, aren't even part of um, Team Blue Sky. But you know, I think like if if they actually got people at Twitter to to listen and try this. Like, I think it's it's really just one thing at the end of the day, um, I think, that decides whether Twitter would do something like this. Um, does it lower user engagement? Because if it doesn't, then they still have users there that they can serve ads to, and, and why would they care? Like, as long as it does not drop their user engagement, if it stays the same or increases it, why wouldn't they do this? Cricket.
Well, one of the anti-engagement practices that I engaged in, I don't know, it's been a few times that it's happened. I have like all of the best ad blockers under the sun installed. So for the longest time, I never saw any ads on Twitter, no promoted tweets, nothing. And then every once in a while they come back briefly. And I think that's just because they've found a way to get around the ad blockers. But every time I saw a promoted ad, I would I would right away block that account because I mean it was useful because not only were most of the promoted tweets completely useless to me, um, but even then I don't like seeing promoted tweets, so I just block those accounts. And then I since I started doing that, I've never seen promoted tweets at all. So yeah, um, if <laughs> maybe that counts as a uh, lower engagement. So. Um, I hope that kind of functionality will be a thing where people can opt out of these stupid advertisements. Well, I mean, like here, would you do that so much if you chose your filters and that gave Twitter more accurate information and you saw less bullshit? Like if they, they were actually more on point? Uh, with ads they serve you and I, I know I know personally you, you know you, you don't like the ads in the tracking period I feel the same way but I mean like a normal person don't you think they would do that less frequently if Twitter was getting more accurate insight and giving them like more promoted tweets they would actually be interested in um I mean I just don't for me it just doesn't work because if there's if there's a product I like, I'm already are I'm already following it or have it in a list if I want to get information about it. And I I don't I never I have never once found out about a new product or service from a promoted tweet or anything. I found out about it through recommendations from friends and mostly off Twitter. So um I mean, I don't know. They would have to like they would have to like drastically improve whatever promotional algorithms they're using about how they choose to promote stuff because it's basically been an abject failure for me. It's done absolutely nothing. It's just annoyed me. Yeah, but like, you see that the point I'm trying to kind of make is how like synergizing, like how that that would likely improve if they gave users these types of choices to use their own filters and actually get more accurate timelines in terms of like, show me what I want to see. Well, yeah, that would be great. I mean, the stuff that I would want to see was not, it probably wouldn't be from accounts that do promotional tweets anyways, because it seems like that just doesn't work. (laughs) Well, yeah, but you know, we're odd people. We are not your normal person. Like I, I think that if if ads started becoming things that actually showed them things that they want to see, you know, norm, normal people would look at that positively. You know what I mean? Well, so something I would love to see. Um, I do. I don't know whether it works economically because it hasn't been used by enough people for a long enough period of time to show that. But I do like the concept of users getting paid to look at ads um, that the Brave browser was doing. I hate the fact that they're using a stupid token that's not actually anonymous and it's under custodial control and everything and you can't, you know, basically KYC coin. Um, I hate that aspect of it, but now that we have Lightning, we could easily uh, hint, hint, uh, remake the Brave browser with Lightning and do that same kind of mechanism. I would be interested in seeing that because um, I feel like companies that would be willing to engage in that e- ecosystem, well, I mean, you're probably going to get a couple of scammers at first. Um, trying to front run everything but i think eventually it'd be interesting to see which companies would be interested in participating in that because it i just like sure i'll look at an ad in a way that doesn't compromise my privacy if it means that i get a bit of money out of it um i'd be willing to test out something like that uh i would not be willing to use it with the brave browser but it would be cool to see something like that with lightning You know, it's funny you say that because that's actually one of the things that um, these two mentioned at the end of the proposal you could do 
<clears throat> if this actually goes like so far that it actually starts decentralizing real Twitter infrastructure instead of just application layer things. And I, I would say that you could also do the opposite that, you know, if you have some clients that um, in order to use them, you have to have some kind of advertising enabled, then maybe you could make a donation of a certain amount to basically say, you know, go away ads and then you don't see any ads and you're just paying for if if they're relying on advertising to run the business or whatever to keep the development of the client going, then if you you can either use the ads or make a donation to make them go away. Mm -hmm. I'm uh no part. You got any more uh, thoughts on this? You can always take investor money <laughs> forever. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess uh, I don't know. I I I really out of stuff to say on this. Um, unless you guys have anything more you want to add. Uh, Bitcoin Core is being flagged by antiviruses. Uh, we released the Wasabi release uh, two weeks ago, which ships with Bitcoin Core, and we got a lot of user reports that Wasabi is a virus, or they are really afraid to to launch it and things because their antivirus companies are antivirus softwares are complaining about that. And that's not ideal. Uh, so Bitcoin Core is flagged by antiviruses. There are two theories why it is flagged by antiviruses. Uh, one theory goes uh, with the Bitcoin Cash thing that the Bitcoin Cash for then a lot of uh, com lot of people. I uh, reported Bitcoin Core as a virus. Uh, this is this theory comes from a Reddit post uh, from Gregory Maxwell. Another theory is that uh, all the coin miner viruses, all the all the ransomware, uh, oh, oh, ma many many viruses are using Bitcoin Core's code directly, and that is what is getting flagged by antivirus companies and so bitcoin core is flagged by antivirus companies and we would like to fix this because this is this is ridiculous that the most peer reviewed software in the world possibly uh gets flagged by antivirus software so Ricardo Mascotti, who who noticed, who, who investigated this issue, offered us to 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 do a campaign about it. That uh, basically the logic is we notify the antivirus softwares; they don't care about it. So what we can do now, more and more people should notify the antivirus companies that hey guys uh, you made a mistake here and bitcoin core is not a virus and for that we have a link in the description if you experience this in your pc or mac probably not on linux then then you could you could it would be very helpful if you could report it as a false positive so Thanks, guys. But dude, they're right. It is a virus. And it's going to destroy all the banking bullshit in the world. They're right, Nopara. Yeah, that makes sense, though. Well, yeah. And also, I want to point out, like, <laughs> if your antivirus software is flagging... Bitcoin Core or Wasabi is a virus. Um, I mean, that just shows you... Sh that's another reason you shouldn't be using antivirus software to begin with because it's... For the most part, it's kind of useless. Um, it just is. If you look... There was a... I can't remember wh what where it was, but there was a interesting... Um, someone researched, like, what, what does the average person... Th think or recommend as like best best uh practices for security and like newbie person would say you know up to date 
um, antivirus or checking your antivirus and things like that. Um, but that that never shows up when you ask like an actual security expert uh, for best practices what you should do. And part of that is because antivirus software is basically in itself a virus. It has uh, it has a lot of control, um, a lot of influence over your computer that you don't you wouldn't want to give to any other kind of software. So I don't know. I feel like if you're if you're running antivirus software, you're probably not even using an operating system that. Yeah, you know, I I wouldn't want to put a Wasabi wallet on that, so maybe you should consider not using that. And also, it's like it's it's security theater. Like an antivirus will protect you from well-known viruses that have been out there for a while that have been exactly identified, and that's it. They won't protect you from variants, from advanced attacks that aren't fingerprinted. Like, it's it's not, like, all it is is, like, the flu shot. Like, yeah, the flu shot protects you from the flu. It's not going to help you if you catch scarlet fever. It also won't protect you from next year's flu or the flu that comes in a few months or anything like that after it mutates a bit. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, it's 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 really, it's not actually keeping you safe. It's just making you feel like you're safe when you're probably not. Yeah, I don't know. Back then when I wrote a lot of viruses, then I could only install those to computers. Those were not using antiviruses. <laughs> because but, you're probably very bad at writing viruses and copying huge blocks of code that have been hashed and fingerprinted by antivirus software. Oh! Yeah, but that just proves my point that most people are, most virus writers are very bad at writing viruses and antiviruses uh, actually work uh, against them. I mean, dude, it's it's as simple as find a way to do the thing you want to do <clears throat> that's not the most obvious way to write that code, which has probably been done before. So, so look, look at it this way. I'm not using an antivirus. Probably Windows have a, have some built-in antivirus in it, and I'm just fine with that. But, but I, I'm not actively using an external antivirus software because I kinda know what I can download and run and zero days are not that common if at all and I did not reinstall my windows for like five years or I don't know a long time but whenever I get to my parents computer I'm like fuck <laughs> They are fucked. <laughs> they they have to use an antivirus. You know, I I can't recommend them to not use it because the the it just it just protects them from the most basic attacks, right? Yeah, but my point is is like that's not like there. Are, how many variations of those basic attacks are there that aren't covered? How many things that aren't really much more complex? Like how many complex? It's like the, the point is, is it's, it's, it's not going to keep you safe if a competent person wants to compromise your system. Like you're, you're kidding yourself. It's the flu shot. You get it yeah, so yeah. you don't have to deal with the flu. It's not going to just magically protect the, the entirety of your health. Yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing against that. I, I agree. Anyway, uh, do, do you have any anything left on this? Or I, I, I'd like to close this that please report your false positive Bitcoin core that it's not a virus because it's not. And maybe if enough of us reporting it, then they actually start to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. I have a better idea. I think we should start reporting antivirus software as viruses because some people do actually use multiple antivirus software things on their computer. I don't know why they think that they're going to catch different things maybe, 
But it'd be really funny if AV software was reporting itself or reporting other AV softwares to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, but yeah, I, it's funny. <laughs> yeah. All right, though. Uh, so you, you, you're starting a club. Does the clubhouse have a beer fridge? <laughs> no, it's just it's just discussions online, uh, and what what we are doing here. I I don't really know what we are doing here. I just want to go through all the privacy research uh, again and in a much deeper level, and I need some motivation for that. So I thought whoever feels this is kind of very interesting thing and would like to would like to explore the privacy research literature not limited to bitcoin but like generally privacy anonymity mixing networks uh, whatever then i'm available for every week once uh, and this this is the idea um not fully committed to it the very first uh, discussion will be monday and it is going to be about the knapsack paper which is discussing how we are doing anonymity with unequal amounts this paper is from 2017 if you would like to come uh, to the meeting on monday then you are welcome. It's it's in the description how you can you can come. It's going to be Google Hangouts. It's going to be recorded. If if I am not too lazy, that I am also going to upload it, <laughs> upload the discussion to YouTube. And one more thing that I emailed the Napsak authors and one of them, I think, is the main author. He said that he will probably come to the meeting. So. So, so I think this will be exciting. Okay, so holy shit, I just had an idea explode in my head. Um, so think about this, Nopara. Like you guys have just recently introduced the like a really basic um, multiple amount uh, mix algo, right? You got you guys are doing the the different uh, denomination outputs. Oh, okay. So think about this. Um, you're already having to coordinate <clears throat> during a coin join. So there's lines of communications between all the participants through some coordinator. What if you started some second layer accounting to really start screwing with things so that like let's say I want to break up coins and you want to condense coins. Um, we can coordinate that while making the coin join and just have those things cancel each other out in the, uh, the, the subset summing. You know what I mean? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, so I, I I will kind of come back to this uh, problem when later when I will talk about the bell number in in today's episode, but yeah, uh, what what I've I've seen is any kind of ambiguity is making the analysis exponentially harder. Well, it's like it's it's like think about it. All you can do is look at the inputs and then to the outputs and, and map the the numbers um, the, the value there. So if you see like two small inputs go in and one larger one come out, I mean, obviously, like you're gonna make an assumption there, and like the the inverse too. If you see a big thing go in and multiple small ones come in, like you you're, you're um, narrowing the this the sudoku space but like if if you coordinate that so that two people doing those opposite things happen at the same time like you're you're screwing with things 
Yeah, yes, uh, but then you are going to incorporate the heuristics into your algorithm, right? That new information that you just learned that hey, uh, this kind of transactions are happening, right? This is the this is the main but, fallacy between pain. But yes? but you you've introduced an ambiguity now, though, because you never know if that pattern indicates that like this type of in like coordination between people doing the opposite things happen or if people just did those things independently yeah yeah but you can assign a probability to it so so you can work with that that's my point this is this is my this is the main fallacy behind the pay to end point stuff that the pay join stuff that uh Oh yeah, this looks like a regular Bitcoin transaction. But yeah, if I am aware that these are that non-regular Bitcoin transactions are going on on the blockchain, that I can just incorporate that information into my de-anonymizing uh, algorithm and and assign some probability that was the probability that this is a regular transaction and was the probability well, that this is a pay yeah. to endpoint transaction. Yeah, I get that. But like, you know, if you think about this, like the only way to really start assigning probabilities in this, like, you know, kind of thing is to look at all of the, the post mix behavior descending from that coin join. So you don't get to instantly assign a probability. Like you have to wait and watch the behavior that occurs after that mix to really start getting any kind of real probability of like, did they just play a game or did this guy just condense stuff and this guy break stuff up? Um, it makes sense. I mean, if, if, you, if you look at the mix and no one spends the mixed coins, then you make the most likely conclusions or, or, or you make, you, you create outcomes in your model and assign a probability to each of those outcomes. And when they start to transact uh, after the mix, then you are improving your outcome probability based on the new information that, that can, came in. So yeah, I think you, you and me need, need to talk about this after the show. Mm -hmm. All right, so but is, um, is the number one rule of the Wasabi Research Club is don't talk about the Wasabi Research Club? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm schizophrenic. Wait a moment, I call Mr. Robot. <laughs> All righty. So I guess we want to move along. And uh, follow up on something? Yes. So, uh, 6102, uh, the, the owner of BitcoinOnly.com, uh, posted an interesting thread on the, the 30th of December. Uh, there, after the, the whole incident with the, the user's withdrawal being frozen because of mixing activity with previous withdrawals, you know, uh, people went to Binance's subreddit and started going, you know, what the hell is going on? Like, what's the official uh, Binance position on coin joining? And some of the responses were very interesting. Um what uh, a Binance mod responded uh, with no idea what coin join is. It's pretty uh, simple. Don't do anything illegal or unethical and you are unlikely to have anything to worry about. Um, then he went on to talk about mixing services um, like traditional mixers and the risk of having criminal funds delivered to you because of that mixer and that they will comply with law enforcement. Um, and 6102 spelled out the, the difference between um, you know mixers and the, the types of coin join tools we have now, which they obviously fucking know about. Um, and one of the, the last replies from the mod he posted on Twitter is everything you've said here is pretty short sighted. Nothing more for me to say than I've already done. Certainly not going to waste time arguing with you. It's simple. If you choose to mix your funds with others, you accept the risk involved in doing so. 
And um, there, there, there were also um, a lot of deleted comments and, and things in this thread. So, yeah. Um, they are, or Binance is getting very weaselly in their responses to the, the, that whole incident. And yeah, I, I'm not... I'm not very optimistic about this exchange, at, at least this particular exchange, um, being friendly or okay to, to use in conjunction with any kind of privacy tool going forward. So I don't want to, I, everyone who is listening to the digest uh, knows already how important fungibility is and, 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 and where this blacklisting can lead to. So I, I don't want to get into that. What I want to get into that we actually had a talk uh, with someone from Binance and um, well, just like this support person here, uh, he is not involved in this at all and he doesn't really know what's going on. So I can't say that was a very very useful talk but what he said is that uh, only Binance Singapore is doing that so we shouldn't have to worry and we should try it out and test it so he couldn't even really tell if only Binance Singapore is doing that but that that's what that was his 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 impression uh, and also, um, we taught him that, well, we, we try to educate him that where the blacklisting thing is going to lead that, well, if you start blacklisting now, then uh, everyone will have to start blacklisting if the dominoes are starting to fall, uh, as, uh, if this was the first demono and and the dominoes are starting to fall, then we are going to end up with a currency that uh, that's a useless or even more likely to split the whole community. That uh, well, uh, some of them those are the basically all of us, the cypherpunks, who actually recognize that how a currency can work and 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 uh, the banks. So which one do you want to be right? That's, that's the main question. And we, we, we told him that we are probably going to launch a campaign about the, the blacklisting that uh, in order to prevent the dominoes falling. Uh, and that actually changed the tone of the whole conversation. And he was thinking we are we are threatening Binance. Uh, so that conversation didn't go well at the end. But I think if if there will be more dominoes to fall and more exchanges are going to blacklist uh, just simply mixing transactions and not even suspecting anything, then maybe a company uh, that actually targets people who are working at exchanges to to educate them that where this thing is going to to end up if 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 they keep pushing this 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 agenda. Mm, on the other hand, because there is really no regulation that would say that hey you have to spy on your customer, uh, what but there are like uh, winks from regulators that okay you have to spy on you may want to spy on your customer wink wink and some exchanges take that and just just want to, to to build a good relationship I guess and and wink wink we are going to spy on our customers right uh I, I, I'm kind of going uh, going from one thought to another, uh, so I, I, I just give give back the give back the topic to you, Shinobi. Well, I mean, I could 
I could definitely see it just being pressure from Singapore because they, they've taken a, a really – in a lot of ways, they've emulated what the U.S. has been doing. Um, you know, they've been moving towards kind of being better in terms of taxes, but like there's, you know, regulating ICOs, there's licensing schemes for the exchanges and things like they're They're trying to build out a big regulatory infrastructure. And I could definitely see just the government of Singapore coming down on Binance. Like this is a problem for us. Uh, Again, there is there is no regulation. There are no rules that that would require for you to do this. So yeah, but you like, don't you don't need official rules all the time. You just need the regulating body to go to a company and go. This is what we want. Yeah, but isn't that what called corruption? You know. Yeah, but it's all, it's it's just the real world. You know what I mean? All, all all you would really have to do as a regulating body or a government is just kind of hint or strongly suggest like this is what we're going to do in the future and those businesses would jump to start doing that now to be yeah. ready. Yeah, exactly. And exactly that's what happened now. What's problematic is that uh, Binance as 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 the big company Binance, right? Binance Singapore is tiny, but the uh, big company was actually not trying to correct their mistake, but double down on the bullshit, right? With 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 CZ's blog post, he was defending what they are doing. Mm-hmm. And another thing is. Uh, you were talking about this uh, last digest, and Chris was Chris was saying that, well, okay, this blacklisting is happening forever now, and yeah, you know what I'm talking about that blacklisting individual addresses or doing chain analysis, but and I I don't agree with that because this is not black and white for now this is not blacklisting and not blacklisting but you know if there is an address that that is obviously tied to something or if there is a transaction that's just trying to get more privacy that that there is a huge level between them right we should actually win the blacklisting war blacklisting addresses but we kind of lost that already because that's already happening but uh letting them to to go to a whole new level and and just simply blacklist people who would like to gain their privacy back without actually any suspicion or anything that's a, that's that's a whole new level of blacklisting and 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 that's that's what i i think about it and that's why i did not agree with what chris said in in in, in that episode which is unfortunately he's not here now yeah and i mean it's you know th- this i can only really speak for america and some of the west But like all the banking laws and regulations are a big double-edged sword when it comes to all of us in Bitcoin. Like, yeah, there's all these KYC and AML laws and regulations and shit, but there's also the things like the Banking Secrecy Act. Like that bank is legally required to keep my information private from the general public. And I think it's absolutely inevitable that people start challenging these things in court under the grounds that, like, I have the right to maintain my privacy as far as this public blockchain goes under these kinds of laws. Like, this, these are my financial records, and I have a right to privacy. 
And I think that challenge is inevitable. And I think there is a very strong basis for that challenge legally. You know, if 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 this would happen, it's going. Uh, it, it can go all the way to the because there is no privacy technology that could hide that you are actually private, right? Oh, just use one arrow. Oh, wait, using one arrow is suspicious. Oh, just use the lightning network. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, using the lightning network is suspicious because we cannot track you. Like you know, this logic applies to 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 everything. Of mm-hmm. course, the lightning network is a social solution, right? It advertises itself as the as the scalability, the the the, the solution. And oops, we have a side effect of gaining some privacy on the lightning network, which is very smart. Uh, but you know, like if, if, if they want to take this logic all the way, uh, you know, we don't know how far this, this logic is going to go that, Hey, if you are not, it just doesn't make sense. If you are not completely transparent about what you are doing to the whole world, then you are suspicious, like, you know? It, it it's it's just so stupid yeah like that there is no way to not stick out when you're being private like you stick out just by the sheer virtue of you're in that crowd of, of private people yes so th- there isn't really a technical solution to it only s- social solutions and maybe a mix of technical and social solution is the lightning network because the lightning network advertises itself as scalability, but uh, has the side effect of privacy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, I I guess it's not that hard to be at stuff on the Lightning Network that takes away all your privacy, right? (laughs) No, it's not. And I'm constantly irritated by people who do that. Anyway, (laughs) uh, we, we talked a lot about it already. How about we move on? All right. So everybody knows that Ethereum had to do a last minute fork. Well, they had to do another last minute fork before the last minute fork. Uh, Parity on December 30th required an upgrade due to Parity nodes randomly not sinking. Um, they were being attacked and like, holy shit, no para. Um, the attack was taking a valid block header um, and making a block of invalid transactions. Um, so they're, they're not like the, the, the transactions don't even connect properly to that header and parity would get that block and then permanently mark that valid block header is invalid um without you know actually checking the the contents it got against the header to see if they matched um so yeah every, everybody running parity had to, to to really quick before the the emergency fork upgrade again to to fix this amazing retard issue like oh my god I, that that joke just popped into my head about um, German Germans not having a th, and I was like, "We're not sinking. We're not sinking. What are you sinking about?" <laughs> but I mean, like seriously, like oh my god, this client was marking valid block headers as invalid because it was sent invalid transactions along with that header and it didn't even check to make sure that all of those invalid tracks and or transactions were actually part of that block header before it just permanently marked it as an invalid block like holy shit it sounds like the kind of decision that someone would make to i mean think about it if you're running an Ethereum client, 
you want to, <laughs> you're running a full node, you want to prevent as much wasted uh, time as possible. So you would do something stupid like, oh, well, if this previous block header has been sent with invalid transactions, I'm just going to block the block header forever because I can't, I can't be, you know, I, I don't think... want to waste more time on this shit. It's like the kind of mentality that comes along with most people not running nodes and it being really hard to run a node. I think you are being way too charitable. And these people were so dumb and had such a lack of understanding of the, the data structure dependencies here that they just didn't even think like, oh, you have to check that before you respond to checking this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it could definitely be that too. Again, not sinking. I mean, like, come on, no part. You you have nothing to say on this. Like, I know you have something to say. There, there is another alternative. Like, you know, you're coding, coding, and how to do to 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 oh stack overflow awesome oh code copy paste oh it works awesome I solved this issue. <laughs> I mean that's even worse. Like oh my, it's like dude, oh my god, like the the level and what whatever the explanation is, like holy shit. How in the fuck did you think a cryptographic fucking commitment system like this could function without that check being performed? Like holy shit. You would be surprised how many things functioning until they don't. <laughs> But, you know, I guess, yeah, they're, they're, they're insanely mentally deficient over there. I, I don't know. I mean, we, we don't have the con context, right? We, we know that they, are, they want to go fast and break things. And this mentality results in, in this. On the other hand, they are innovating faster because they can go fast and break things. Innovating, air quotes. Finding new and inventive ways to break everything since 2014. <laughs> you know, negative results are still results, right? We, we had to try how to do how to do this thing in a decentralized way in order to figure out that eh, it doesn't really work that way and it doesn't really have to be decentralized. You know? Mm -mm. Nope. Um, they're retarded and I need more popcorn. Ah, man. So, what's my next excuse to eat a lot of popcorn, Gene? Uh, well, a few episodes ago, we talked about some weird stuff going on with MakerDAO, the weird stuff being a vulnerability that would allow one of the major stakeholders to basically take over the system and uh, possibly, I think, take control of the ETH involved. Um, and you got all quiet. Oh, you can't hear me? Yes, no. now we can. Oh, sorry. Okay, so starting over. Um, a few episodes ago, we talked about how there was a vulnerability in MakerDAO, which would allow one of the major stakeholders to basically take over the system and potentially uh, take control of the ether involved in the system. And there was supposed to be a community vote to fix that vulnerability um as far as i know it was not successful as in the vulnerability is still there um but instead there's been an announcement from the maker foundation that they will be selling 27.5 million dollars worth of maker tokens to uh two companies the first one is dragonfly capital partners and the other one is paradigm and i think i think at least dragonfly is the one that's actually based 
in Asia. I can't remember about Paradigm, but I think that one is also in the Asian market. Uh, it's something that they talk about a lot in the post about how this transfer will help uh, with these uh, companies' involvement. It will help them expand to the Asian market with MakerDAO. Um, so they say uh, both will actively participate in the decentralized governance of the Maker protocol. Uh, blah, 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 multi collateral die, blah, blah, blah. Um, they uh, they apparently believe that MakerDAO represents the promise of decentralized finance. But again, they're still like skating over this issue of like, oh, we have this vulnerability. We should probably fix that. They're like, no, let's just give a 5.5% uh, stake to these two companies to m maybe mitigate the issue of just not having a just i don't know if i don't think 5.5 percent would do very much but it may decrease the uh position of the foundation enough that they might not be able to perform the attack but that still doesn't really fix the issue um so yeah that weird is happening you'd think that they would be interested <laughs> or you think that if they really cared about decentralized finance they would be interested in fixing this issue at the code level but instead they want to fix it at the let's give a bunch of money to these two companies i guess but why like <sighs> I like how do they not understand that finance is based on relationships which are based on trust and that you can't just magically decentralize that out of the picture like that's the whole foundation that it's based on Yeah I mean I don't I don't know you would have thought that this would have been a pretty bad PR thing for them to have this vulnerability and I'm well, they could have, you know, gotten a lot of praise for fixing it relatively quickly because they basically put up this vote a day or two after there was a blog post um, outlining the vulnerability and saying like how easy it was to do. Um, they could have gotten a lot of praise for like acting quickly and fixing it. And I don't think they have fixed it as far as I can see. So it's just kind of just showing that this is another project that I have no interest in, not only because it's not Bitcoin, but because they, at the end of the day, they don't actually seem to care about decentralization. It's just a marketing buzzword to them. Yep. Oh man, this is like, seriously, the watching this all start to implode on itself and everybody stay in the bubble is it's, it's, it's hilarious. It It is a priceless MasterCard moment. Oh, I and mean, um, there, I think it was Peter McCormick who did an interview with some people in Argentina, and they pointed out that they don't, they don't actually have that much interest in DAI um, because it's just, it's not useful to them as some of these people claim, because there was an article going around a couple of weeks back about a guy in Argentina who was um, supporting himself by using DAI and it was like, look, ETH is money, even though this is not ETH, this is a token on ETH and eh, kind of having issues. Um, but they were like, oh, look, it works. Uh, it's helping people. But it's like, yeah, there's got to be a few people in the world who are in a position where that kind of stuff helps them. Um, but even even if you look at the general population that's involved in cryptocurrency at all, which is still a very small amount, um, it's not useful to most of them. Yeah, I don't see how a collateralized token that's collateralized by a crazy volatile asset that's really hard to liquidate uh, is going to be useful for most people. Like even places like Venezuela like bitcoin is incredibly useful there but it's still only a, a small percentage of, of people using it or it's like the the individuals using it to then go on and help other people without using it at a much greater level you know what i mean 
Yeah, there is a chicken egg problem here that uh, the places that would benefit the most from Bitcoin don't have the infrastructure to run Bitcoin seamlessly. But I mean, or, this is going to change. Or just the Bitcoin in that market to supply that market. I, I was actually uh, thinking about uh, more basic things like uh, internet no, I, I i know what you mean but i'm just saying like even if you solve those problems it's it's where where are they going to get the bitcoin from because i mean really think about it like you know, let's use the most extreme absurd example like i want to try and get people in ethiopia using bitcoin and they they magically have computers and internet now um how do i do that like what 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 can i get out of somebody in ethiopia in exchange for that bitcoin that's easy for me to then get out of ethiopia or that will hold its value if i don't and it's like that that's that's a problem is like how do you get that that demand met well uh you you can you can do this uh look here is your money that's not working and here is bitcoin that's kind of working so it's it's your choice no pressure <laughs> no but my point is like they want bitcoin where do they get it from like where is that bitcoin going to come from like what can what do they have of value to the people in the more developed world that have all that bitcoin that they can get to them I don't like, know. You know People why, can work. Like, why would I sell? You know, you know what I mean. Like, why would I sell Bitcoin for Zimbabwe fiat currency, or like, why would I buy something from someone in Zimbabwe that I don't have a need for, or that I can get here cheap, oh, or like, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, you can buy their services. They can translate to you, for example. Yeah, but I mean, think about how niche the, those markets are. Like, there's going to be a problem because that's only going to be a small amount of people who have those services that people would want who have Bitcoin. Like, that, that it, it's, it's a market issue there. So, I don't think that's a problem because that's just network effect. Some people use that first then more and more and more and more people. The, the real problem is that Bitcoin is not ready for them. And maybe when they actually think about, oh, let's start to use Bitcoin, Bitcoin still won't be ready for them. That's, that, that's my main main issue with that. I don't think the adoption would be so so hard or we would have to push anything. I think if Bitcoin would be ready for for the world then adoption would just take care of itself because it's just just better than what what they have but then it, it's like it's a tail end though dude like bitcoin doesn't work its way into those places at a massive level until those places develop to supply goods or services that better off people who got all the bitcoin want you see what i mean I'm sorry, but I don't. All right. Well, I guess uh, I know you're up next with uh, something else failing finally. Completely out of nowhere. A surprise. Yeah, definitely a surprise to no one. Um, <laughs> so if you may remember, back in April 2018, Coinbase paid... Um, at least, I don't know if it, I thought it was actually more than a hundred million, but, um, somewhere around a hundred million dollars to acquire earn.com, um, reportedly for the reason, uh, the reason being that they wanted to, um, get Balaji back into the company and he was currently working on earn at the time. Um, so yeah, it's now, uh, a year and let's see a year and three quarters ish later um and it looks like they are going to be sunsetting the i don't know if they're going to be sunsetting everything about 
urn like if urn itself is just gonna go away but um apparently the micro task platform aspect and the the paid inbox um part are going to be going away and i didn't actually find a public announcement of this it was apparently sent in an email to to earn.com users where they said that they will be sunsetting earn.com to fo- focus exclusively on coinbase earn so i guess um yeah it says coinbase earn enables users to earn cryptocurrencies by completing educational tasks so the the part where You know, they've been doing promotional stuff with Zcash about you learn how to use Zcash, you know, uh, note in a way that is not anonymous or private at all because they don't allow that on their platform. Um, They've been doing all these educational things about Zcash and even MakerDAO, which we just talked about, and I guess also the Brave browser with the stupid bat token. Um, So that part will currently... Uh, that part will apparently continue, but then in February of this year, um, Earn.com is going to be non-functional. So it looks like they, it looks like they just kind of migrated some aspects of Earn into Coinbase directly, and now they're just getting rid of Earn as a. Oh, cat is walking on keyboard. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, they're going to. It sounds like they're just going to keep um, some aspects of it that they've already migrated into Coinbase directly, and then the rest is, I guess, going to go away. Um, But one person who was not happy about this was Jameson Lopp, and um, he said that he had been using the paid inbox feature and that he was going to miss it, but that uh, he had already uh, built his own one using BTC Pay Server, um, which is much better because that means it will use, uh, it's possible to use lightning then. Um, so yeah, if you are someone who wanted to use this and you have the accounting manpower to, um, <laughs> handle the tax situation that will be created with everyone paying you to send an email, um, you can go ahead and use that code because he's published it on lop.net. So if you cared about using that, you can keep on using it and probably get a way better service than you ever got with Earn. Yeah, it's like I don't get why they would kill that as that seemed like an actually useful thing. So like what what like stop a, a useful thing that could potentially grow to be very huge as Bitcoin continues growing to pay people to eat up your shitcoin propaganda. That's well, a smart move. I mean, I think I I don't like running it. I think that the the feature itself is useful, but running it as a service, I would not be surprised if they just like made absolutely no money from that because you have a relatively small group of people that would be interested in or even know how to set up and get involved in um, having their email paywalled so that people, you know, will send them Bitcoin in order to have their email seen and read or responded to. Um, And then you have an even, I think an even smaller group of people who would be willing to actually pay to send emails. Um, Because of course, I think a lot of people would be like, yeah, I'll receive Bitcoin for emails, but then there's not a lot of people who want to actually send that. So I think it's a very, it's a very niche market and you're dealing with I mean, I assume you're dealing, I never looked what the rates are, the average rate is that people were asking for, but I assume that they're relatively small payments. So you're not going to be getting a lot of revenue from this. So it doesn't really surprise me that Coinbase doesn't want to run that, even though it is a useful feature just, for Just those pass people. on the fees and charge a fee, and then you just make a percentage. I mean, like watching and managing deposits you're already set up with all the infrastructure there that's a rounding error i'm actually a big fan of the earn.com idea i really don't like it that uh Balaji and these people did it because if i would want to launch my own then 
I would be afraid of getting sued or some stupid thing like that. But it's 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 so straightforward. Uh, some people are very busy, but some people really want to connect with those very busy people, so they pay for it. I think that's a, that's a great idea. The real issue is how do you put it to the market? They, they couldn't figure that out. Maybe maybe a Slack model, like like how did Slack start? Slack is what is Slack? It's a email and chat and all together we had a bunch of similar services. So how 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 Slack corner the market? They actually built it for themselves. So they built it for their own teams, and then another team said, hey, this is actually pretty good. Can we use that? Oh, yeah, sure. Here is use that. And more and more teams started to use Slack. Maybe that's how you would you would launch this earn.com idea that uh, you build it for yourself. And then someone asks you that, hey, uh, can I use it too? Oh, yes, sure. And you... You build up a very, a very enthusiastic early adopter crowd, and from there on things are happening. But the real problem is that Coinbase, uh, Twenty One, Earn dot com, these companies don't have an enthusiastic early adopter crowd. They have, they have people who, who kind of don't have another choice or too busy to 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 look for alternatives and no one really cares about coinbase as a oh yeah i'm a very very satisfied 21 customer or coinbase customer <laughs> satisfied 21 customer with that uh, 21 uh, robot uh, computer that's going to mine for you or I don't even... <laughs> the butt box yeah so they don't have satisfied customers <laughs> yeah and like you know nicholas should just honestly fold this into btc pay proper Cause it's like you know, I, I I didn't even know this until I started using it. But like the the fact that you can just let anybody register an account on your BTC Pay server and use it too, like anybody running a BTC Pay server could just also just flip a thing in the the settings, and then anybody could register and use like a an earn like pay to contact me thing at any BTC Pay server that turned it on. Like put plug their own pub key in or hook up their own like lightning node remotely and then boom you know what i mean yeah i think this is awesome because the technical technicality is not the hard part here the hard part is how do you get uh, get it to get other people to use it and nicolas just put down the basics for okay so now anyone who feels the ambition or feels a bit entrepreneurial they can build on top of nicholas's stuff and actually get the thing to the market in a successful way so so i think that's that's awesome it's a huge enabler yeah and i mean it's like dude this shit like yeah like btc pay can be a lot more than just like run your own payment processing for yourself like anybody can be a bit pay like anybody can bundle things like what, what jameson built to replace earn into that like it like that could wind up being a whole stack of all kinds of different services on top of that that anybody can just step in and run uh-huh uh -huh. but yeah uh, Ginny, uh, you got any more thoughts on this? Maybe crazy ideas? Do I have thoughts on what? On the idea of anybody being able to just let anyone else sign up and use something like what Lot built on their BTC pay server. Um, I would have to check. I mean, the only thing I'm worried about is... Um... 
I I don't know how well it integrates with like diff it depends I mean I assume these people are hosting their own email server and they're not using I don't know how well that integrates with other inboxes cuz some oh, no, not it, everyone it's, it, it's trivial like any any email provider is going to have uh, ways you can get SMT pushes from different places and stuff Okay cuz the yeah the only I mean, I guess it's email, so generally you assume that email isn't very private. It's not really designed to be private. Um, so I'd be interested in looking at what the privacy implications are in terms of, like, um, I don't know. I wouldn't really want there to be a well, clear I mean, connection between, like, a payment and a uh, communication showing up. That might be hard but i mean like, it'd be real simple just have a web form that like hooks up to an email address you run that puts a reply email and a message in there and you pay and then that gets blasted to your personal email if it pays and then like if you want you could encrypt that and just get an encrypted blob or like do that however you want like that that's a, a real simple flexible thing yeah, I mean that would that would definitely be interesting. Um I mean at the end of the day this will mostly be used by people who actually get a large influx of emails and they need a way to sort them. Um I don't think anyone actually expects to make income <laughs> for like any substantial income from answering your email unless they do have a large influx of emails um so again i think it's a it's a relatively small market um in terms of like who will be incentivized to implement this well i mean you could do it a, a hundred different ways who says that the person receiving the message has to keep the payment I could just run, like hook up BTC Pay and make money acting as a spam filter for you, and you don't you don't make anything. I just I make money filtering your spam. Yeah, that's true. And I guess you could also you could make it automatically reroute to someone you want to donate to. I guess if you don't really care about actually getting the money. Or if you don't like, if you don't care, like I said, like I, I just, I'll keep it and I'll filter your spam. I mean, why wouldn't somebody use that? It, they don't pay anything. Um, the guy providing the service makes money, and they get their bullshit filtered out. But yeah, uh, I think we we beat this one to death. All right, Nopara, you're up with bell number. But let, yeah. Let's see if I if I fucked up. Uh, Topically, by by not putting this with the other of your stories. <laughs> nah, it's okay. Let's move on to mathematics then. So, in the past episode, last episode, we talked about cash fusion, and there was a question of what anonymity would uh, naive coin joins provide without any kind of amount equality and i was digging into more to this question and i i can't say i i can't say i actually have the solution there because it just depends on so many variables but the most basic level of 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 what it what it depends on is 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 quite astonishing and that's why i want to introduce the bell number here uh, which which is very relevant so what i did is i was thinking about how can you de-anonymize uh, large coin joins and there are various ways to do that and it turns out all of those ways are very inefficient without any kind of assumptions so if you just look at the blockchain if you just look at a single transaction on the blockchain and it has one input one output then 
you want to figure out how many sub transactions it is it it has it, it only has one because one input one output there is no other way to to organize the inputs and the outputs so let's say two inputs two outputs now you want to find the subsets uh so one subset would be the basic transaction that the two inputs to output that that could be one because the sum of the inputs equals to the sum of the outputs now you have to start organizing it uh, to find more sub transactions the first input does it correspond it does it have the same amount as the first output mm. No. Does it have the same amount as the second output? Hmm. Yes. Oh, awesome. So the second input then has the same amount as the first output. So you found another two sub transactions, uh, which is in the same partition. So why does it, why is it relevant? Because a brute force algorithm would be would be looking at looking at all the possible partitions that you can organize a set <laughs> and a brute force algorithm would have to iterate through all these possible partitions now uh, <clears throat> the bell number is the number of partitions of the set so an empty set has one partition the empty set so the bell number is one a set with one element has still one partitions that one element so the bell number is still one a set with two elements has two partitions uh, the first partition is that both elements are in it. The second partition is that a set of the first element and a set of the second element. So it has two partitions. The bell number is two. Uh, with three elements, the bell number is five. With four elements, it's 15. Five elements, if it's 52. Six elements, 203, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, just in a couple of <clears throat> more elements, we get to a number that we cannot actually store in the memory of our computers, let alone iterating through it. And this is really interesting because that's how you find the sub, sub transactions of a coin join. So if you have a hundred input and one output coin join, then you would have to iterate through a number that is so large that as I see it written down, it doesn't fit from uh from the left side of the screen to the other side of the screen right which, which is just just yeah that that that's not not happening uh now there is an optimization and the nux nux up paper actually shows an optimization for this uh subset some problem to to, to solve it but it's exactly as bad as 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 bad as hard so even though so you see that napsack paper provided the the best possible optimization for the for the algorithm to solve the the subset sum problem uh, as a lower bound that you cannot really do anything better than that and and, and and that's that's just growing exponentially just like like the bell number so the conclusion is if you make very very stupid very large coin joins 
then you are you have anonymity just because the coin joins sudoku cannot be done uh in in reasonable human times now the problem with this is quantum computers and other assumptions so for example in wasabi based on the number of of uh, equal inputs you can see that how many participants there are so that helps a little bit there are before transactions and after transactions the mix and that helps too or someone exposes his his mix and that uh, lowers the number but it's very interesting to think about it that indeed you just do very stupid coin join transactions and that still provides privacy because the de-anonymization is just uh, so expensive that with today's computers you cannot do that mm -hmm. and, and and again i don't know where what to what to do with this information but i'm hoping to figure out <laughs> well i mean you know like something i've been thinking about since the last episode with cash fusion was just this kind of because it's like you know the one issue we know you know exists when we talk about coin joins like the denominations involved kind of set a ceiling for how much money you can actually really mix in terms of the anonymity site you get so like what about the applying this kind of of math or mathematical treatment to coin joins to whales like pretty pretty much like a, a coin join strategy for huge whales that won't necessarily care so much about the the huge fees for doing things like this in exchange for the privacy or who can just like fragment like outputs just for the privacy benefit and never have to like condense two of those ever again to meet any payment obligation that they would have you know, and then kind of like look at mixing differently um you know in, in these less efficient ways for these larger uh, amounts of uh coins yeah i mean mixing is no matter how you look at it if you are not uh, not trying to do this naive coin joins then mixing is always for people who are willing to pay the difference so so that but my, my point is like tools made for normal users with like normal person amounts of money will never be suitable for the guy trying to mix millions and millions or, or billions of dollars. So like maybe we just have to look at mixing for those relative amounts totally differently. And maybe for amounts that large, people would pay for the, the extra fee and block space to do it naively and just brute force it. And they would be able to afford to take like this UTXO and break it into 10 UTXOs because the, like, the amounts are so large, I'll, they'll never have to combine two of those to pay for something. You know what I mean? Uh-huh, uh-huh uh from my from my experience people who 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 come with with a large amount want to live with large amounts but that that was my my uh reasoning to that uh, we do 0 0.1 bitcoin because that's pretty much enough for anyone to use like 0.001% of the time you would need more money than okay maybe 0.1 you would need more money than 0.1 bitcoin but in the end people who come with with a lot of money want to live with a lot of money so yeah but does it really work the, the that's just people trying to to minimize 
future fees in terms of percentage. I'm talking in the long term when those type of people go like, oh, I want privacy now. I don't want every transaction I make to tie back to like this whole stash of coins. Like eventually the those type they're gonna want to be able to mix and fragment things. And maybe like this type of strategy, I don't think it, it makes sense or fits for like normal people or, or plebs with pleb money. But you know, maybe this would work for those massive whales that down the line are gonna wanna fucking mix shit eventually. Because like, oh, I don't want anybody I pay to always see like, oh, this guy has 10,000 Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, yes, that, that was my point that my, my reasoning at the beginning was the same, but what we experienced was different. However, I actually want to take that back because maybe I'm just... I, I'm just having biases here because the information that sticks out when people actually really start to merge together that coins, those that information comes to me. And if if it works properly, if nothing happens, just people using it properly, that information is not really something that sticks to me. So so maybe maybe and just just an impression of mine. So maybe maybe you're right. I mean, but I'm I'm not even talking like just now. I'm talking like in the future. So like maybe like whales don't want to do that now. Maybe they will in five ten years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Yeah, let's think about Craig Wright. Well, in a shocking spin development that nobody could have expected in the Florida case between Craig Wright, otherwise known as Satoshi Nakamoto, and David Kleiman. Wright said maybe he won't be able to get the money, you know, maybe the those 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 keys and the, the bonded courier might not actually show up. I um, mean he, he can't he can't be sure. Um so Whoopsies, I guess I guess in his deposition on January 14th and 15th, he's going to have to explain himself. <laughs> it's like so good. I mean, dude, dude, I feel like this is the, the return of the king of like the Bitcoin world. It's like, wait, th is that the end? No. Okay. There's more. Is that the, the end? No, wait, there's more. <laughs> But 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 it's always like it's not there is more it's a twist. <laughs> <laughs> did did somebody hire M Night Shyamalan for this? You know we are very very close to 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 get a Craig Wright redemption saga right when he tries to tries to get everything right <laughs> what he did. I assume by explain himself you mean come up with another conspiracy theory to, uh, you know. Yes, clearly fucking Blockstream with their Silk Road ties had the bonded courier assassinated. <laughs> and Greg Maxwell is secretly a ninja and he did it himself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Yeah, do you do you guys know that uh, that game that is coming out that uh, Lightning Network game? Is there is a skin? In, it's a Bitcoin game, and the there Fortnite is a clone. skin in there. Uh, Raiki, I think it's called Raiki. It's from the Southern Toby guys. There is a skin in there that that a Blockstream spy gets oh. into something, and <clears throat> Maxwell. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, the... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going. Yeah, at the end. I love the memes in this space. Oh man, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, I don't know. You guys ready for the last uh, last update? Yes. Yeah. Well, one of those mainstream things that most people probably aren't gonna like, because this is what mainstream looks like. But uh, Rakuten, um, the pr pretty much the the Japanese Amazon, uh, 
and I actually missed this. This happened the day before uh, Christmas. Christmas Eve announced that they are connecting their loyalty points program to the Bitcoin exchange they operate, Rakuten Wallet, and allowing users to exchange their loyalty points directly for cryptocurrency. Um, so, so one, um, they, they pretty much their points are broken in between standard points and then like limited points. Um, you can only exchange the standard points for this, but one point is one yen. Uh, you have to exchange at least a hundred points. Um, I think there, there's different account tiers, um, where there's a transaction and a monthly limit, um, for the. The regular one, um, it's 30,000 points per transaction and 100,000 a month for their diamond tier. It's 50,000 a transaction and 500,000 a month. But um, you know, all Rakuten customers with loyalty points can now do these exchanges for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Bcash. Um, so pretty much, yeah, um, instead of spending your loyalty points on discounts or products at the store, you can directly take them and translate them into Bitcoin uh, if you use the Japanese equivalent of Amazon. Uh, I think Jeff Bezos should take some notes here. Yeah, I think this is great. It's straightforward, no bullshit, no ICO. It just, just, it just use Bitcoin in a straightforward way i think this this is great yeah i mean the, the perfect thing is it's like it's just keep doing what you're doing um as a consumer except now instead of buying your free pebble watch uh at the end of a couple months or whatever you can put that into bitcoin and it's just simple click click you do that I mean, this is the, the perfect kind of passive way to just get total normies uh, into this ecosystem. Like just a simple, stupid way that they can accumulate without really putting any kind of thought into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Janine? Yeah, that sounds really cool. I don't see Amazon ever doing that, though. <laughs> uh... You know the, what, the fact you know, that the, the fact that we constantly get fake stories about Amazon adding it tells me that we're not going to do it. I'm not saying soon, but I mean, like this, this it's an incentive to use the platform that could wind up being a very powerful incentive. You just reminded me to the guy who in 2012 said that he's going to eat his own dick if Newegg accepts Bitcoin. They do. And it's happened. So we're going to have two dick dinners uh, on TV this year? <laughs> let's, not, let's not expand on that logic. How about that? <laughs> All right. Well, I guess then uh, it's final thoughts time. Who's up? Yeah, let me start. So we, we were talking about the Reich. The, the the Japanese Lightning Network game and actually there is going to be a demo in the Advancing Bitcoin conference uh, in February and Nicola Dorier and me are going to fight against each other I mean it's not really going to be a fight uh, it's going to be one-sided as I'm going to kick his ass but uh, but it's still nice that he's 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 okay <clears throat> that, uh, that that this is going to be there and and they asked photos of us uh, which means to recreate us in the game <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> you're going to be in a video game too now? awesome yeah <laughs> I'm in some stupid video game ripple tards made where you just walk around and people say fight about ripple and then Joel Katz comes in and explains why it's FUD. <laughs> there was also another video game. It's like Pokemon Go, but uh, instead of Pokemon, it's Bitcoin people are the ones who you can catch. And, <laughs> and I, I actually, 
Maybe you are in it. I don't know. <laughs> oh my god, that's ridiculous. Well, uh, uh, Janine, what, 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 what's your thought? Beep boop. Uh, my final thought is that I noticed that um, that Matt and Peter on the their Bitcoin 2019 final re- review mentioned me in the last uh, 20 minutes or so of the podcast. So thanks for the shout out. That was really cool. There was a few things that they they were like they were like paraphrasing what I had said in the um, episode that I had done um, for Tales of the Crypt um, months ago and with Matt and Marty and a few of those things didn't match what I had said but that's okay they weren't major but I'll fix it in the future <laughs> Whee! all right uh, how about you yeah. Uh, uh yeah uh, my final thought kind of feel odd uh, doing this but me and Mr. Hodel uh, have a Bitcoin swag store now at uh, bitcoinshirt.co. Uh, we're going to try and slowly build up uh, some cool low-key swag that doesn't scream, uh, I have Bitcoin, rob me please. And uh, maybe maybe some digest stuff uh, might pop up there sometime in the, in the future. So if you chuckleheads want to give me your money, Go do that. I like money. Cough it up. And don't forget to like and subscribe, as always. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, on that note, uh, we'll catch you later, punks. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, you can have a voice, you're